Richard Wilson, uh, sculptor and Royal Academician. He is critically acclaimed as one of the most inventive sculptors of his generation. His large scale works really demand that we totally reevaluate our surroundings when we experience them. It really knocks our perceptions off kilter. And that was definitely my impression when I first encountered one of his earlier works, um, 2050, which was a, an installation, absolutely huge pool of thick black recycled engine oil, just completely filling ga a gallery, quite a big gallery, up to waist height. Um, first at Matt's Gallery, then County Hall, where they have a gallery, um, Satchi Gallery and others. And it's now, um, I think it's bought by a Tasmanian collector and is permanently installed there. Um, it was described as um, one of the masterpieces of the modern age by the art critic Andrew Graham Dixon in the BBC TV series, the, the History of Modern Art. So Richard's work, and many of you will already be familiar, it really tampers with the familiar order of architecture, whatever that is anyway, and it's and it particularly vernacular forms. And it draws heavily on its, in its inspiration on, um, from engineering and construction. I picked slides this evening, which is where I happen to have dealt with the tampering with architecture, the sensitive undoing of art, architecture. I was once described as the mad axeman, and I had to correct the journalist, and I said that everything is, is calculated and ev everything is sensitively choreographed, um, to which they, he eventually agreed. Um, so starting off with the work that was first described. This is probably about 35 years ago now, but it's been a grand calling card for me. It's been all over the world. Um, it's always been described as a site, uh, the, uh, the classic example of a site-specific work, and I've always argued it's not site-specific in that it's not site-dependable. It can go wherever I feel it can go through an invitation. It's not fixed to the walls or the floors in any way. And what it does is it's just a reflection in a reflective material, albeit a hazardous waste material, you'll be arrested for pouring a jug of that down the drain. If you get it on your dress or trousers or whatever, it's a nightmare. But what is amazing is through filling this room, people talk about this in terms of beauty, which is very exciting because I've taken a hazardous waste material and I've tried to sort of change people's preconceptions about what they think. And I think that's what the whole of these works that you'll see this evening try to do. They try in some way to challenge our preconceptions by having to take a second look at something. This is hazardous waste material. It floods the room and I create in each installation a corridor into the space. They're all completely different and they all um, reflect the surrounding. And so you stare down to the ceiling and through the window and out into voids. Quite an uncanny experience, a completely psychological experience. I'd rather liken it to the moment when you're either going up the stairs in the dark, you get to the last step and it's not there, or when you're sitting at the traffic lights or in a carriage at a station and the train next to you pulls out and you don't quite understand what's going on. You're not moving, it's the train next to you. But you get that rather quirky moment where you think you've started your journey but you haven't. You've hiccuped and, and kind of fooled the brain itself through brain-eye contact. So these are all um, different installations from 1985. Of course, I have my favourites, some work, some don't. Um, and it, they come about through an, um, <coughs> an invitation to a space. I'll go along, I'll design how the piece of work can work, the way it can actually do things like flood round corners and tease us to lean over and look into the piece. And of course, it's challenging the architecture. When I first start any idea, I start predominantly with models, not always, sometimes sketching. And when I first got this idea, I was away from the studio, I was in the Algarve, and I knew suddenly that I had the idea. Ideas can take many, many days, sometimes weeks, but by the time it gets to months, I tend to abandon them because they become overworked. They become almost like you can't find the solution, drop it and get on with the next thing. 
Um, but in this situation, I thought, I need to see this piece of work. I need to hold that maquette and stare at it. I drove into town in the Algarve, into, I forgot where I was now, Portimao, and in the street was an old shoebox. And I had some glue, and I took the shoebox home, and this was the very first maquette, out of rubbish, out of waste material. Um, but for me, it's a treasure, because it's the way a concept can be realised and seen through making the model. And at that moment, I just needed to have some material to, to somehow define the piece of work for me. Following on from the first installation at Matt's Gallery in 1985, I was invited back in 1987, and it was a very difficult piece to kind of conquer. You know, the oil um, found so much appraisal that I had to go one better, or I felt I had to go one better. So this time I started to think very physically about the space. And in terms of that reflection, what I was doing was doubling the volume of the room through illusion. And in this situation, I decided to shrink the room. So, with the gallery director's permission, Dr. Robin Klasnick, I unfastened 20 foot by 6 foot of the crittle clear window and brought it into the room and then boxed it out to its boundary line of architecture and beyond. So there was a funny kind of refractive moment. You weren't quite sure where inside and outside happened to be. What you were aware of is the space inside had shrunk and the outside world had grown. And, of course, you can see through the window and beyond, and, it, and it's just flooding with air and light. It's boxed back in a certain way, typical of, say, the sort of imagery around windows, like curtains. So this is a kind of TIR plastic rubber that is puckered like curtains. And the top and bottom sections mimic the ceiling of the gallery, being that they are sort of like a glazing process where you drop the um, softboard sections into a framing device to support. And that's that boxing beyond the boundary to give you that quirky moment. Um, stepping on from that, we're moving forward. I've forgotten the date of this, about 1991. I was invited by Renton Howard Wood Levine, who were designing a new Dovecot gallery up in Stockton on Tees. And they wanted me to make a piece of work that either sat outside of the facade or on the roof to announce something about the, um, the um, or what the building was about. It was a live performing space. They had a theatre, a cinema, a restaurant, two, sorry, two bars, a gymnasium. They didn't have a gallery um, and a music space. And I took the, I went and saw Renton Howard Wood Levine, they were based in London at the time, and I went and got their plans and started playing around with a lot of models and maquettes and finally decided upon the idea that if it's an event space, a performing space, the building itself has got to perform. And I have this idea that, you know, I, I believe that all architecture is a very, very slow or fast event, depending, you know, a demolition is fast, but the landscape of London for example, would be a very slow event of, of slow change. In this situation, what happens is a section of the facade is actually cut out. In this instance, we've constructed. Whilst the building was going up, we made an eight metre bearing, and that sat on, if you imagine a skateboard turned upside down, but giant. Um, this was... Um, uh, the, this was the Brie Soleil, this was the glass, and this was the, the basic sort of facade in rendering. And what happens is that oscillates only 300 degrees in one plane. So what happens is the opaque becomes transparent, and the transparent becomes opaque, and at the same time it's a flag way giving piece to say performance performance. Um, so these are just two very early photographs. The piece is still there today, it's still working, um, and that led on to a very interesting situation in 2008, where working with Price and Meyer structural engineers, Tim is here this evening, <laughs> and uh, of, uh, an interesting company up in uh, Lancashire, this was a response to an invitation to do something for the 2008 uh, Capital of Culture in Liverpool. And I went up to Liverpool 
and had a look round for some ideas and came across a very interesting building. It was the old Yates's Wine Lodge on Moorfield Street. And if this was the de a derelict building, it was the forlorn, it was the forgotten, it was the written off, it was the unsightly. But I realised there was a possibility of doing something with that because what had happened, I think about eight years previous when I did over easy, the previous piece that moves 300 degrees in one plane. One evening I was rushing a maquette and I had the circular piece of over easy standing on the table and I glued a spindle to it. And in the morning I came in and it had gone like that, it had fallen over and then stuck. And I picked it up and I thought, oh my God, I've got to build that again. But when I spun it, I realized immediately that the idea was there through a happy accident. And so this idea was progressed, as you saw then, through a series of maquettes. These are just a selection of the many, many models that I make. And um, it was taken to Price and Myers. I sat with Robert Myers. I showed him all the models. He said to me, by the way, Richard, you must learn to use CAD. And I said, Rob, uh, Robert, these are very democratic. We've all been playing and touching with this. Scissors were taken to the models. Pencils were taken to the models. Cups of coffee left rings of coffee on the models. And I felt they were a very democratic way of describing the idea. So what happened is we dismantled the facade and then reconstructed it. I won't give away too many of the secrets. It's a sleight of hand. They don't really saw the woman in half that kind of thing. What we managed to do was mount that section of ovoid facade um, onto a spindle and start to rotate it. I wasn't sure of the speed. And when we first did a test run, it took three days to get the right speed, people were just walking by and not noticing it. But the faster we got, we started to pull an audience. And at that point, I knew that was the speed it had to be. So it was a rather threatening piece. But what takes place here is the fa facade takes a 360 degrees rotation on that spindle, powered with some two big motors at the back on a big, big slew ring. And it not only produced, uh, protrudes out over the street, but backs itself into the building itself. And I think one of the... There should be sound, we can't hear it. What's interesting, if you can imagine taking a tube and you go into the wall like that, it'll give you a perfect circle. But if you take a perfect circle and you put it into the wall like that, you'll get an ovoid. So people couldn't understand how the ovoid could come, come back onto itself. But it's just to do, again, with geometry and the way you take the vision on it in the street. Straight on, it'll be circular. As you move to, uh, uh, side on, it's a circular. Straight on, you've got a peculiar ovoid section. But you understand the way the spindle is turning that piece of work, opening the building out to expose the interior and then closing itself off once again. Again, this can go anywhere, depending on the nature of the building. Uh, this was the old Yates's Wine Lodge in Liverpool, and one old gentleman came up to me and he said, a lot of people saw that building doing that before you did it, meaning they'd all stagger out at night with Yates, <laughs> full of Aussie whites. <laughs> so that was 2008. I think I can turn that off, can I? So this now takes us um, to 2000. Uh, an unusual structure standing next to the vertical and horizontals of the temple gateway up to the temple in uh, Niigatar Prefectory. 30 artists from around the world asked to come along and to Niigata and have some form of relationship, relationship to the site. And this was one of my early pieces in the outdoors or in the outside world. And it, it was a bit of a strange one. I was very unsure as to what to come up with. I'd spent about a week, 10 days in the region, and I was getting a little bit frustrated. An idea wasn't suggesting itself to me. And I knew I had to have a relationship to the landscape in some way. But I was thinking, I've, I've been playing with architecture uh, in that part of my early career, and I had to come up with something that I felt comfortable with architecturally. And it was only on the flight back, the long haul flight back, when the sun was coming up over that horizon, you get that lovely curve, that the idea suggested itself to me. What I was going to do is my relationship to that region was my ex-house in England 
with its back extension and odd, you know, up and over type gable and the front facade, I would transport that art, that house, that architectural element of the house to Japan, but maintaining the verticals <coughs> and horizontals of London, exactly where it stood in, in Rotherhithe. What that meant was Price and Myers again had to make or take, is it angles of collimation, Tim? It was five angles of collimation off the North Star. And from that, five points were placed in the ground in Japan. And it meant the house, rather than go round and stand like a normal house in ja Japan, was pushed straight through the Earth's crust and popped up at um, Niigata uh, Prefectory in the junior high school. So what you have here would be the back of the house. You've got the base of the house, you've got the bit, that's the front facade, and this is the roof section stuck in the ground. So it's a relationship between two houses on the planet. And of course, one could do this anywhere. I kept meaning to get permission to take the verticals and horizontals of the gateway to the temple and do that in Southwark Park, because it would be similar, upside down, sticking out of the ground. Um, these, very quickly, are a series of examples where if I'm not invited to play with outdoor structures or big installations, there are objects that are built. And this is a reference uh, um, to the room. What's happening here is very simple. It was an, an exercise in trying to make the interior of a building bigger than, it, than an exterior. So what's happened here is you've got the English version of a Scandinavian chalet. And I think this show was in Norway in the museum. And then what I've done is I've copied this wall with its little vent and this parquet and placed this great big section of interior into this exterior so that the interior is greater than what is happening in this situation. So you've got a clash of inside and outside of architectural elements playing off with each other. One is a complete alien to this room and the other is a copy of the room. And you enter one door and exit the other. This is just a simple, thing, playful thing of taking a caravan and twisting it 90 degrees um, and not, a, not exposing in any way what takes place inside. So you're dealing very much about the structure of facade. And then this led on to a whole series of works more recent, which was called Stealing Space, and hence the title of this lecture this evening. Well, I started to look at... Um, you know, like the shapes that space can have. What's interesting, we all spend our lives in space, but we don't really see it and we don't really know what it is. The only way to do that is to give it in a boundary. So we know there's a space here because we've got four walls, a floor and a ceiling. Hence, we've got this space. So I had to start thinking about walls and barriers to describe spaces. So what we did in this situation, I worked with two students, and my, experiment, my first experiment was to set up a track in my house between the basement space and the bathroom. And then we made some runners with lasers and we drew a whole section, rather like taking a laser now, and just going round and you'll get a shape and you'll get another one. If you imagine boxing that out, you've got a very interesting section of shape that you can make. So these drawings were worked up to create the tracking mechanism for the lasers. And we started to get an assemblance of a shape that was, that was being born. And that shape was made, but I was unhappy with it. And what I did is I took that shape apart and compressed it. So this ended up in a gallery in Italy, Gallery Fumagalli. And this was called uh, Stealing Space Compressed. So it's not the actual space of the room. That was made, but we cut it and compressed it to produce a sculpture where... Things like the stairs and the balustrade and the, and the beam that supports the roof or the ceiling of the basement, etc., are all detailed in a construction in wood. And then there were sort of mocked elements. There was a curtain to the room downstairs, so there was a sense of the curtain through that, that uh, wood. So there's a whole series of ideas about that, playful ideas about spaces in architecture and how to make facades, making the flat sections of architecture three-dimensional. In this experiment, this situation, 
It was a, um, because it was at the Annalee Judy Gallery in Dering Street, 2017, I think, or 18, um, we got some guys in to do some scanning and they scanned the facade and then I just simply took one of those, what they call nets, you know, how to make a cube out of six points, you know, you could have four and two and fold it, or you've got this c configuration which takes elements of the facade and then when folded up you've made the flat into the three-dimensional. And these are all prototypes, so they're all made in uh, MDF, but they have the potential of being reproduced in any other material. Let's say, for example, aluminium, buffed aluminium. So it's a series of series of playful, again, playful drawings and sketches that lead it, le led up to my models and then into the computer for the manufacturer and the CNC cutting of those elements to give us the shape. And this was another example, going back to the compressed, the, the stealing space compressed. Um, this is the entrance coming up the stairs on the fourth floor into the Annalee Judah Gallery up to the doorway from the window. And we just had a sc whole scan done of that section of the corridor. And then in the computer, we actually chose a section, which was then reproduced once more at Jonathan's factory up in Hull. And we went up there and this was produced as a shape. So what you're getting here is, if you can imagine turning that shape round, these two hollows are where the door handles are. And you come down the steps, these are the steps. So it's a kind of a negative of the positive. And that was the structure that ended up being um, a slice of space. And there's, a, of course, it means that one can go into one's world and start grabbing sections and talking about what space might be. It's a very th difficult thing to describe what space is, but I've heard some lovely stories. I heard one story, I don't know if it's an urban myth, but there was a um, Japanese director of a telephone, mobile telephone company, and he wanted to make the smallest mobile in the world. And they worked and worked for about two years. And finally they came up with what they thought was the smallest mobile. And apparently he asked, it was brought to him at a meeting, and he asked for a tank of water, so they brought in an aquarium. He dropped it in and a bubble surfaced. He said, smaller, there's still space. And I thought that was very interesting, that a bubble, um, you know, represents that. The other story I heard, which could have had a bit more fun, was a man moved into a unit, and the unit was full of rubbish, and he had to clear it. So he stepped outside, and next door there was a unit, and it had a skip outside. And the guy went into it, and he said, can I chuck some rubbish away? And the guy said, well, how much have you got? That was all sorted out, and so he was given permission. The next morning, a car pulled up, and it was the director of the company next door that had given permission. He was unaware of this news, and he said, what do you think you're doing? And the bloke said, it's all right, I'm, I'm throwing my rubbish away. I've been given permission by your guys. It's not that much. I won't fill your skip up. He said, that's good, otherwise I would have done you for theft if you hadn't have asked. And he said, but I've, I'm not taking anything out. I'm putting stuff in. He said, yes, you, you, you'd be stealing my space that I've paid for. So that's another kind of idea about what space can be, how it can be described. So these were all sort of prototype elements to demonstrate uh, situations of space and structure and form, all in the sort of positive-negative, let's say, and all dealing with the breakdown of the flat to the 3D and the invisible to the visible. Uh, again, Jonathan Green's company up in Hull produced this. I bought a model, I enlarged it, and Jonathan's company CNC'd the whole lot. And what it is, it's the start-stop building. It's actually the Nuremberg Ring, ring um, starting line on the, on the uh, racetrack grid. And what it is, is one section of the model that I bought, one quarter section of the model, is reproduced eight times. You produce four of those, and four of those in reverse, and they become one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you've got eight sections that all come to give up together to give you that overall shape. But very much about the decoration of facade, obviously, using words. Sometimes you can make out what they are, and sometimes in reverse. And it's just a, a little passion I have. I like, I like seeing words and, and letters and numbers on buildings. 
Um, again, this is harking back a little bit to stealing space. I was intrigued by that wonderful heist that took place by those old guys, you know, several years ago, where they went into Hatton Garden. What they did is to enter that vault, they bought some coring equipment to core that hole. And I, I've worked with coring equipment, and I cored the Serpentine Gallery many, many years ago. And we swapped the cores around so I could drill a hole in the wall and I could put it in the floor, take the floor, put it into the books and take the books and put them up into the ceiling. And we did a kind of jigsaw puzzle like that. So we exchanged things that reference something like the floor where that floor would become a section of wall. In this instance, there was a measurement when they discovered the burglary or the robbery. And this was the hole they drilled to be able to get the human body through to undo the safe. And I was rather intrigued by the whole thing, and I thought, actually, that represents something about the human body, you know, to get something through. And it was just a very simple exercise in making, making that space. So we ended up with that form. And when you look at that form, you can't work out how someone managed to get through it. Shack stack, again, looking at the rules of architecture that are very playful, the bricoleur playing at building allotments when the definition of the window is challenged because it becomes a roof and the definition of the corrugated, um, or the, yeah, the corrugations are used in certain ways to make walls. So you've got an untruth playing itself out. You've got things that are designed to function in a particular way, but they're being used in another way. And it's very beautiful, that inventive way. You know, an old polythene bag can become a seal instead of a glazed window pane. So it was a mimicking of that. So many drawings and photographs taken from allotments. And it was a case of building those and then casting them. And then back more recently, a um, piece of work on the corner of Holborn and Sardinia Street. This is London School of Economics. And they wanted something on this chamfered facade end that isn't 90 degrees. It's only 45 degrees. They wanted a small piece down at the road level, or the pedestrian level. And in this instance, what happened is I scanned a metre wide section, I think it's just over a metre wide section of the height of the building on Holborn and then a section, a completely random, you know, I said just there, do that one, just there, do that one. So we had two scans, one on the main street, one on the side street. And we took those skins of architecture, albeit scans, and we produced them as castings and produced a jesamite corner that turned the 45 degree chamfer into a 90 degree chamfer. But the problem we had also was we weren't allowed to make contact onto the pedestrian way. Um, so what we did with the section of model is we put a forklift on it and slowly pushed it up to crumple the plaster mould, plaster fiberglass mould. And that produced a way of getting over the problem of touching ground or touching earth. We pushed it up above the first floor height. So you've got a randomness going on. The function of architecture makes no sense now because we've got windows right on that very edge making contact with each other and not really making sense. The rules were broken and challenged. And that's the piece of work. So it's, it's a chameleon piece. You know, you, it's difficult to get it, but when you see it, you can't stop looking at it. It's cleared the space here. It's all crumpled up, and you've got these copies. So it's sitting comfortably with the architecture, but it's not obeying the order of that architecture. Examples of how that works. And there's a sort of very de defined gap here, just to say it's different. It's Jesuit, and it's Portland stones. We've got port. Portland powder in the Jesamite. So, again, the materials are very, very similar. Hang on a minute, lads, I've got a great idea. They wanted uh, artists to look at sites around Great Britain in 2012 for the Cultural Olympics. It was the Olympic bid we'd won, and they wanted artists to somehow come up with ideas. And I was invited to go and look at the Dulawar Pavilion, a very beautiful uh, building. Is it Mendelssohn? Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, 
And I thought one doesn't really want to tamper with this building. But what the building was doing is it was starting to instruct me into certain things. I mean, it had a flag. It had this wonderful sort of protruding edge. And it wasn't so much the planes of the building that suggested to me, but it's more looking at the edge of the building. I thought, how can I talk about Mendelssohn's architecture and, and bring one's attention as the onlooker to the edge of that building? And I, I kept thinking, it's going to be something like that coach in the, in the Italian job, you know, where you've got the precipice, where you've got the edge, you've got the horizontal, you've got the vertical. And I thought, actually, why not just do that? Why not reproduce the coach and stick it on the De Loire Pavilion. It's a, it's a seaside town. Um, you've got the end of the pier right, you know, the idea of the donkey. You could have something on the building. Um, it's a, in the film, it's a red, white and blue coach. So it's a flag-waving piece. It's our, it's our, you know, Great Britain flag, let's say, flying. So I instructed the people at the De Loire if we could take the Union Jack down during the course of the exhibition because we're putting up our own flag and of course those guys that went and did the robbery at the fiat factory um they were going for gold as were our olympic our olympic teams they were all hoping for gold so there was a lovely metaphor about gold that somehow sat comfortably within the idea as well so it's a set of in this situation it's a set of thought processes which help to design the piece of work and that was 2.12. Uh, as you can see, the flag is down, but our red, white and blue flag is waving. No gold inside. And that's, um, that piece of work went shortly afterwards to the Peninsula Hotel in Hong Kong. Seven floors up, I think it was. <laughs> Just about viewable. And subsequent to that, it went to the uh, Asimo um, Art Fair in Turin that coincided with the 50th anniversary of the making of the film. So they asked me if I'd come up with a piece, so I took the coach there and we clad the building, it was a building site, in a wrap which we had printed as a cliff face. So we have, and the coach is quite a simple structure, I mean, albeit it's probably not that weatherproof, there's a little bit there that could corrode after a couple of weeks, but um, you can see each time it's built, it has to work on a chassis that bolts to the building itself. And then the piece is activated on an axis or fulcrum point here, and we've got hydraulic pumps here, cylinders, that are basically doing press-up. So it pushes the coach up, and it's coming down on its own weight. And that's all fired off by a whole um, hydraulic pump system that sits out of sight. 18 holes coming up... Um, Still got time, haven't we? This is um, Folkestone. It was the first Triennale, 2008, I believe it was. And Folkestone, again, a little bit like Liverpool turning the place over. This was a rather forlorn place, you know. I mean, you got the feeling that its heyday was over, and a little, there was a lot of dereliction down on that seafront promenade. And I was strolling around, and I came across this rather hidden 18-course crazy golf uh, course and I was asking what was going to happen to it and it was all going to be ploughed up and I thought what we could do is we could take something of the heyday convert it and make make it suggest <coughs> something of a future so you take the past you adapt it in the present and the future is presented and it's about the rebuild of, of Folkestone basically but using what would be familiar to the people on that site so I got some cement cutters, cutting teams in, and I'd marked out a whole series of patterns, and we took 18 elements to build three beach huts that would sit on the, on the seafront. So you've got two sections of a gable to make one hut, a back and a front, and a side and a side. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, three times. And these were all cut, but they were cut where the holes were in those sections. So, hence the title, 18 holes, and you've got, you know, one, two, three, and you've got the hole, the hole, the hole, the hole, there's a hole up here. So, in each one, there's the hole, there's that lovely idea of the lake where you'll lose the golf ball, and there's the slide, and there's bits of the pavement that people would walk on when they take the putt, which all become vertical. So, you've taken something which you think 
is on the horizontal and you know it's past and it's becoming something that's sort of announcing a future. Yeah, another hole there. <laughs> and that's it amongst all the other rather brutalist uh, architecture. All oh, mine's cement, this is steel and wood and breeze block. And yet mine's more sort of romantic, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, the Amy 2, which became the Arco Trent, which became the slice of reality. Still down at Greenwich. I still own it, but um, I don't use it anymore. I've got friends in there working with it. But I bought that ship. Um, I've forgotten the date now. I think it was just before 2000. Um, 18 and 25 artists were asked to come up with ideas for the Millennium Dome celebrations. And Anthony Gormley and myself chose out of nine that were finally selected to work off-site rather than on-site. They wanted large or, let's say, monumental pieces, but because of the reclaiming of the site and the amount of cadmium that had leached itself into the river, the whole of the site was capped. So there was only 18 inches of soil that you could place a work on. So it seemed improbable that you could place a major structure on 18 inches of dirt because you weren't to touch the substructure for fear of puncturing and then again leaching of cadmium. So buying that ship um, worked in, I suppose, three ways. I think, first of all, what I was trying to talk about is the fact that Greenwich can be sliced by the line of latitude. Is it latitude or longitude? Latitude. And it meant that, for instance, up at Greenwich, up at the observatory, there's a path. It's got a brass line going across it. And people go up there and they stand with their legs across that line because it's significant. It means something. It's like what people do going over Tower Bridge. There's a gap. And it somehow it makes people stop and think about how they want to approach that gap. So I was thinking, if I can announce that line, that um, GMT zero line, in some way, by putting a slice of something on it so you sort of activate it, that would be one possibility for a sculpture. And I thought about taking a slice out of that ship, which we did, but it became, in the end, a chunk. It was impossible to take, you know, a fine slice away. And then that was located at that point on, Mer uh, on the Mer Meridian Line, but around on that dome site. But it also spoke about parcels of space, rather like the dome itself, which is a big parcel of space with structures that support it. Support it. Um, but... For me, what became significant is that area of the river in 1936, I think it was, the coronation of the king, had seats right the way around because people could watch ships going in and out to their commonwealth, taking money out, bringing goods back and vice versa. Goods out and money back. Money out, goods back. So if you go up there now, there's no ships on that stretch of the water. It's all redundant and forlorn and forgotten. And this, I think, was a reminder of that heyday and the fact that now, you know, that industry is um, shrunk and sunk and forgotten. And in a way, this is a metaphor for that lament, that loss of that great industry. You've got this portion that sits to remind us of that, that situation. After the Dove uh, exhibition in 2001, they said, what are you going to do with the piece of work? And I said, what I'd do is I'd, I'd leave it there. And the Dome official said, you couldn't. I said it wasn't on their land. <laughs> so I went and saw the Port of London Authority and requested permission to keep the ship there. They granted that permission, but said I had to buy a perpetuity licence, which I did. And it became an office for five years. Uh, but then surplus to requirement. It was difficult to get services there. It was difficult to get a broadband system there, um, pool table. Um, so it became surplus to requirement. Um, there's been actions and all sorts of things going on. I've had experimental music bands playing. Uh, Jem Finer very recently shot one of his laser beams across from Trinity Boy War, which um, carried a sound and was retranslated so you could be on the slice, look back to Trinity Boy Wharf and listen to his thousand-year piece playing on the slice of reality. So it's an open canvas for people now to go and do shows, exhibitions, whatever they want to do. 
and there's a couple that have moved on who are hoping to run it as a small improv uh, situation. People playing improvised music. This is the last piece. Bit of a long story here. Again, um, Price and Meyer Structural Engineers and CSI, Commercial Systems International, but all based, oh, based up in Hull, Commercial Systems. What we did is, I came up with the idea, this is the Queen's Terminal, Terminal 2 at Heathrow Airport. We're going back to about 2012. It was finalised in May 2000, or launched 2014 of June. And this is the airport under construction. And this became the hub where all transport arrived. You had all coach and cars. And the train system lifts up through this enormous concourse and into the terminal itself. The whole of this expanded roof from the terminal supported on 11 columns. And there was a competition started to have a number of artists come up with ideas for what could take place in that space before you get into the concourse, before you get into the terminal itself. Um, it was shortlisted down to, I think it was seven, and then finally it was awarded to me, and I came up with an idea about throwing an aeroplane. Just taking an object like that, and if I threw it across the room, what kind of shape would that make? Imagine taking that in a fictitious world and throwing it in this room that's full of clay and it'll make a hole. And it's a case of what that hole might be to make a structure, to make a form. So it was taking an aeroplane and playing around with it, trying to understand what that <laughs> overall shape might be like and getting some idea. I love those drawings where you've got a football stadium and there's like the Queen Mary next to it to give scale about how things work. And particularly the number of London buses to give a, a, a notion of size that we all understand. This is a very good way, as is that Airbus, in telling you how big something might be and whether it is big or whether it's medium size, depending on architecture. In this instance... People said, my God, why big? Why so big? And I said, well, it's only using four columns of the whole of the 11 that were presented to the artists who were putting in a proposal. So, in a way, size is relative. It's like what feels right. Um, so I don't see it as big in, in terms of this structure. So what took place here, this is just to give you an idea how we came across the... Uh, how we came across the shape. The aeroplane was a generic form based on Paul Bonham's Red Bull Air aircraft, which is won three times. And we took his generic form. We went to the company in Utah. We borrowed their, um, their, uh, their software. We put it in the computer. And Tim and his team, how long, Tim? A year and a half? Just crunching numbers. <laughs> Twelve and a half thousand hours to get that Twelve shape. And Twelve and a half thousand hours, I was going to say. Yeah, and that's the shape that uh, it gave. And then it's a case like, how do we then start to make sense of that shape? You treat it like a loaf. You cut it up into its separate sections. And here, I think it's 21. Yeah, 21. So you can start to put that in the computer and start subdividing your problem to make it easier and then marry all the problems together when they're resolved to make the overall form that gives you that shape. There are all these designs. A great uh, amount of detail was spent on a particular bearing that Tim and his team had to design. What had happened is we hit a logistical problem where... About a third of the way into the project, there was a team of people, I think it was Department of Transport, who were very concerned about an explosion at the airport and whether this would fly everywhere. And the psychology of airports is very interesting when you want to start trying to make something. You realise everything is designed around a terrorist act. And in this instance, they said, if a bomb goes off, it's going to fly everywhere, you can't do it. Tim and his team said... We can do it, we can tether the inside, we can hold it. So a section was produced, it went up to a site near Hadrian's Wall where the <coughs> army blow things to test, and the section was blown up and it didn't go everywhere or anywhere, which gave or presented another problem. If it's not going to go anywhere, it's going to load the column and push it. And that 
then meant, what are you going to do about that? So again, Tim and his team designed lateral loaded bearings that move. So within the structure itself, within the sculpture, we're dealing with issues we hadn't first been acclimatised to, but we had to throw budget at to overcome a problem, otherwise we'd be closed down. So the bearings were all designed and built. And then the inner structure, your armature for the sculpture, a set of um, bridge building columns and spars that would build these cassettes, the 21 cassettes, that were all built on the horizontal. It meant the teams could work round on a ladder as opposed to having it in its actual position, which was unstable and very difficult to clad. So a lot of lateral thinking going on to come to get round all the structural construction problems. And a whole series of these cassettes were manufactured in steel and then bulkheads and then laths that would then accept plywood, two, two um, skins, all custom to their shape. These were all designed individually to fit just that section. And 21 of those were produced and clad in aluminium, pot riveted on. And when they were ready, they were shipped to the airport. We were given a window over a couple of months. So a truck would go down, I think it was two trucks. Uh, CSI designed all the apparatus to lift these things up so that then the trucks back in. They were then lowered onto the, onto the lorry and then another set waiting at the other end to lift it up. The lorry would move away. We had a window over the two runways to get in. If we were late, we'd be fined. We weren't late once. Everything worked to a very good pattern. In fact, I think CSI won an award for that, didn't they? I think they did. I think Martin told me this. And then in place, the, the um, sections were brought together between each column. Here you can see the side loaded, well, lateral bearing anchored onto the column that takes the spars and then, rather like a pearl necklace, you just tag them on. You fit, you fit them on. And a whole team of climbers who were trained up in the factory up in Hull. It's quite interesting seeing them all hanging off the ceiling one day, all with tools, like pop riveting. They were all hanging there, and I think it was six or eight weeks. No, it was four months, sorry. Four months of work on site. Couple up there. On cherry pickers, on ropes, etc. Less, uh, taking all the sections up and patching in between the sections where we had the columns, because these, it was impossible to actually make all of that in the factory. That was a kind of a bit of an improvised moment. And the final piece is that aeroplane of, the, of Paul Bonhams, that Red Bull <coughs> aeroplane, which has won the World Championship three times, flying through the space, talking about velocity and talking about what airports are about, um, moving rather like a drill bit. As you move along, the thing is undulating and turning, not physically, but within your vision as you, walk, as you come up the escalator and go into the terminal across the two bridges. All clad in sections that were all specific to the location. Everything was numbered. It was beautiful, the detailing. And I think that is the last one. I think we're all quarter past. Thank you. Emily. Hey. Um, hey Richard. So you talk about an unrealised project, which was the Southwark Park kind of upside down. Game. Oh, as, as, um, yes, an idea. Many money unrealised, but yeah, that's yeah, like one that could be. About any other unrealised projects or like things you've, you've thought about? Um, well, th things don't always get um, played with and brought to fruition because of the invite. There are certain things that come off as tangent from an idea that you might be working on for a client, let's say, or a building, and that tangent you follow and then you park it and think, well, that may not necessarily be a site-specific piece of work, but I can certainly pull that out the hat should I have a request for something where it might fit? And there are pieces like that that I'm playing with that um, certainly need budgets. That's, that's the downside, you know. When you, when you haven't got a, a paid brief, 
you've got them in maquette stage, you've got them in drawing stage. But the good thing about that is with the teams, and it's all of this is teamwork, you know, it's not just me, but I dream up the ideas and then the teams work with me on how we can all get it to fruition. Um, but the teams will probably do the engineering side. We get to certain stages with every idea that's parked and that will sit and wait. And I mean, for an example, there's an idea which we're pushing. It was going to go to Riyadh, but we're not sure if that's going to happen now. Um, but I've got it, and there is someone else who's interested. And it's basically taking an architectural structure, but turning it into a tornado. In this instance, it's a, it's a dying architectural form, which is a garage. That will soon disappear. And what we've done is we've just spun it up 28 metres up into the sky. And it's just all the architecture flaying around, you know, but all with the go fast strips of neon with la you know, logos, that kind of thing. And sections of the garage. I mean, great idea. The drawings are there. It's part of the engineering is there. Um, and depending, you see, they're, they're slightly flexible. We could go to, let's say, a petroleum company and see if they would sponsor it and have their logos on it. So we've got ways in which we might be able to bring things to fruition that weren't possible before. But there's always hit and miss, and there's always going to be stuff that is coming off, uh, but not always realised. And that's not to say they're big as well. There's some small little pieces which I want to make, but I just there's only so much time. That's the other yeah. thing, you know. These things are very time absorbent. Um, so we just, you know, we we wait, and if it happens, it happens. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, man yeah. with the green hat first, and then and then this other guy. Could I ask you, please? Space is so specific. I'm intrigued about when a piece is moved, that piece that went to Tasmania. Mm. Do you have any jurisdiction? I mean, would you even condone a space being built round a piece, or is that a bit like sort of cutting a Banksy off? Wall? No, no. I think you've you've hit the nail on the head. I've had situations, particularly with 2050 two situations where it's almost as if they didn't get the idea. I mean, the, the idea is to take a space and with the right permissions and with the right interior which I can work with, I can flood it. I can build a structure that will hold the oil and it will transform that room. What I don't like doing and I've had to do is in two situations, I've built it uh, that's been built in a room that's been built for me and it doesn't work. The only other time I've done it, uh, there was no way round the problem, but it was requested at the Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo about a year and a half, two years after Fukushima. And the whole of Southeast Asia's uh, planning laws on material substances, particularly hazardous waste materials, particularly flammable materials, etc. Uh, it's impossible to do that piece of work. You couldn't do it. So we did it another way, but I didn't call it 2050. Um, in actual fact, it's very interesting. It's not flammable, or let's put it another way. This, there's lots of things in this room that are flammable, but it'll take quite a while to get them going. And you've got to get the oil, the waste oil, up to a specific temperature before it ignites. And you'd have to put a lit tyre into it to do that. I mean, I've thrown matches in just to demonstrate it won't ignite. <laughs> when I've had fire officers looking at me, who've fallen on the floor. You know? <laughs> but I know, that, I know the haze is out. What we do is we use cleaned oil. So all, let's say the heavy ends, all the carcinogens, um, all the flammables, all the, the large particles are all exited. They're all removed from the material. All you have is oil and graphite. And it's, it's very difficult to fire that up in very low temperatures. It's almost impossible. You've got to really um, get it up to, up to temperature to do that. Which, which reminds me of a lovely story a fire officer was telling me. He said, we sometimes put a lot of fires out with paraffin. And I said, that's interesting. I thought it was flammable. He said, it is, but at low temperature, it's not as vicious as water. You can put water on a fire and it will steam and it will really blow. Whereas paraffin won't allow that to happen to certain objects and, fun uh, and substances. There we go. Um, yes, please. Sure, thanks um, for your, your well, talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I always get caught out. I mean, I'm going to ask you, like, what surprises you? Uh, or is there anything that consistently surprises you when you build work? 
that you've noticed. I mean, I always get caught up by things being a bit bigger than I thought they yeah, I mean, the, the, there's, there's several answers to that. The first one is, of course, the element of surprise when you've done it. You know, like, for example, just been talking about the oil. I didn't really know what it would be like. I made maquettes and poured oil into them and that sort of thing, but you don't really know. When you actually then go for it, there's moments, like we're turning the place over. It's a wow factor. And when I feel that, I know I've got something really good. If I don't get that really good positive feeling, and there have been pieces where, you know, I've spent lots of time making them, and they've not really given me back that reward because we've gone too far down the build process and we can't afford to break, you know, tear up money. So I've worked to try and stay on course and get to what my, uh, my uh, dream might be, let's say. But when, when you get that feeling, that's really good. Um, the, I'm trying to think what else, you know, I suppose, I mean, it's always great when someone says, I really want to support this. That's always a good one as well. Because sometimes you're looking in the dark, you, you're bringing out one of those possibilities that was on board to be done, and then for certain reasons there's a cancellation that's always prevalent or always prominent within any mm -hmm. idea that you're going, to get, you're going to get doubt, you're going to get someone say, look, we've not got that kind of money. Having said that, I always try and cut the coat to suit the cloth. You know, if, I, if, if someone says to me, can you design something? I say, how much have you got? Because I don't want to come up with an idea. And then they say, oh, we haven't got the money for that. So I have to have parameters to know what I'm doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's nice to know that there, there are people who are really interested. It's very difficult at the moment, however, to get stuff done, so particularly in this country. There's not the money anymore to make those large pieces. Rather frustrating for me, it means one's got to go further afield, which isn't unusual. I've done that in the past, but, but it's always nice to sort of play at home, let's say. Um, but surprise, I mean, yeah. Um, I don't know, one's always kind of fairly understanding of the ideas and I think what that is is because I mistrust ideas I'm, I'm always quite confident and therefore there's not much of a surprise factor because I torture an idea I mean I draw it I draw it I draw it till I come back on myself yes it's the right and then I'm making models so I, it's like a mental gymnastics it's almost like I've got to make friends with it before it's even you know come out the ground let's say it's nice thought making friends with an idea <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, yes. I got the surprise question as well. Does it? You spoke about how you had to speed up the rotation of the facade. Was yeah. it surprising what people don't notice sometimes? And is, do you ever enjoy what watching people not notice something, or is it always the moment when people start to notice that's the fun part? Um, I don't know. I think in that response, uh, with turn the place over, it was quite obvious that we could only go up to a maximum size, uh, rotation speed. And at the same time, I didn't want to mimic over easy, which was very, very slow. It was almost um, imperceptible. You, you, if you were driving in a car, you'd miss it. If you're walking along the street, you'd see it moving. It was probably about half the speed of a second hand. So it's like 120 seconds to do 300 degrees. Very, very slow. And of course, I, I was hoping to get something quite structurally daring going. But of course, if you overcook it, you know, you're, there's a lot of wear and tear on the machine. It's carrying 26 tonne on that cantilevered um, uh, spindle. Um, so I knew I had a parameter I could operate in. And the first thing I said is, what's the fastest we can do? And it was a bit scary. And we all knew we couldn't go that far. <laughs> so it was a case of like, OK, we can't do that, but we don't want to do that what do we find in the middle? And it just ha so happened we were all up there for three days and you just watch people walking by and there was a moment when we had a massive crowd and if you slowed it down, they'd walk away. I mean, we knew we couldn't speed it up, so we just thought, well, that's the speed. And it was given to the, the public. So that was quite interesting. Um, in other situations, like the rocking of the coach, that's just a random program doing that. It's a small computer on the pump and it's just sort of, you put in a configuration, and it's a repeat cycle. You know, it's probably 12 different rocks, and it comes back on itself. But it's enough not to really get it unless you're, 
you know, a real anorak. You sit there all day and you understand that it's a, it's a repeat program. So, yeah, there's some things that are purposely and deliberately designed in. And there's other things that there is an element of the accident or the sleight of hand or the chance moment of it, you know, being, ah, oh, that's it, you know, we do that. Oh, we've got uh, this guy and then Paul, thanks. Hi, Richard. Uh, my name's Tom. Um, always been a really big fan of your work from when I was first at college and then to the fact of the Dead War Pavilion. <laughs> I live not far from it, so um, big fan of it. But it's quite interesting looking at all what you were saying earlier. We've had a very startling presentation that you do a lot of hand sketches and make lots of the uh, models. And when someone said to you about using CAD, you said very much no. Um, whereas clearly towards the end of, or sorry, towards the end, the more recent projects are very computer technology driven mm. from you doing a scan of your house. Mm. To, so, so have you now embraced the technology yeah, more? Yeah, it, it, it's another tool. It can't be avoided. I mean, I started my career with colour slides. And now you saw that. I don't know how that works, but I've got a damn good idea how the colour slide got itself together, if you know what I mean. So really, I'm old school. Um, but like with all the big projects, it's like the Beatles said, try with a little help from my friends. So it goes out to the teams that know exactly how to do it. So obviously Price and Myers, one example, where I can say, look at this, and they go... <laughs> And it's on screen, and then we all turn from the model, and we're on that. And you need that. There was absolutely no way in which I could do that myself. But, but at the same time, there was no way I could actually draw what it was I wanted to do. So, for example, when I went to Price and Myers and CSI for the first meeting, they said oh, yeah, we've got it. And then we had a subsequent meeting two weeks later, and it wasn't what I wanted. They made a plane do that. It wasn't based around my drawings. I went off to a pet shop, and I bought a big, clear hamster ball, and I made an aeroplane. I put it in there, and I said, called them all back, and I said, this is what I want, and I just bowled it along the floor. Because then it did its own thing in that sphere. It wasn't flying. And everyone went, oh, my God, you don't want that, do you? You know, like it was the, main, <laughs> the biggest headache I've given them. But that's what I want, and that's where we went. So I was working empirically, you know, like marching troops over bridges to test the structure. I was working in that kind of way, in my own way. Uh, another thing I did is I went to the Royal Academy, funny enough, to the schools, and I built an apparatus and filled it with margarine. And I had a pole with an aeroplane on it, just to get some idea. And I heated it up, and I plunged it in and twisted it and sucked the melted margarine at the same time. Then I poured plaster in, so I had these kind of really crude things. But within that crudity, there were moments where you just go, my God, look at the magic of that. You know, but it was the way I was coming to it, as opposed to... And they're both interesting, and they're both incredibly difficult. But I haven't got the time to learn the programming aspect, the software aspect of that. But there's some damn good people out there, you know, who can do it so easily. And I'm, and I'm absolutely in favour of that as well, because it's, it's the same as a bandsaw, or a circular saw, or a welding, you know, a, a milling machine, whatever. It's just it's got, it's, it's got its own intricacies, and I respect that, and I can see it gives me a good result. In one way, you know, if I'm making small works... <coughs> I mean, I used to have a good eye and I could keep it in. I'm competing with, with those people who run, you know, those production companies and technologies. And when they make for artists, you know, I'm looking at my stuff and I turn around and look at that. And, you know, it's like Richard Deacon with his stuff. It's perfect. You know? I'm looking at mine thinking, how can, I, how can I get that back? And you have to go out to industry and the experts on the big scale. I do like touching and making the small stuff. I'm still in contact with the idea and the form and structure. That's why I build a lot of models. But it need, when it goes to that next level, I just don't have the physicality, the, the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it has to be done in teams by people who know how to put those, that size of structure together. Um, we've got Paul and then we'll have Chris. We'll need to make that the last question. Yeah, as fascinating as it is. Um, then we've got plenty of time for drinks where we can carry on chatting with you.
Would you say your art oscillates closer to architecture or engineering? Interesting. Well, it dabbles in both. Uh, it's probably more reliant on art. Uh, um, it's more reliant on engineering, but it has in the past used the subject and matter of architecture purely as a material. I mean, some people say they work with clay. Some people say they work with casting and bronze. I I used to work not all the time. I used to work with this, you know, all this, and adjust it. Um, so architecture is vital, but as a, as something to be played and manipulated and altered to the extent where you have to look twice and understand it. But the engineering is crucial to make it work, to make it stand up in the world. Chris? Two, two parts to my question. One, uh, Richard, that fantastic talk, really energising. Um, you, you talk about friends within your world of fabrication, engineers, fabricators, architects even. That's a constant change, for, presumably for every project. And, and, but they are people who are familiar with your work. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are lots of... Sorry, if you... So the, it, the, my question is, okay, in a way, you're stealing time and a, a kind of space within their work as well and, and creating something really exciting for them. Yeah, I mean, if you're travelling to, let's say, the other side of the world, example, the Peninsula Hotel in Hong Kong, it was impossible to use engineers from the UK because they, uh, they wouldn't be local to the, um, the problems facing the roof structures that we were dealing with, or the roof structure we were dealing with. But they're obviously have branches around, you know, and I've forgotten the engineers who I was involved with then, but they had a team in London, they had a, um, you know, an operation in London. Um, but you go out and obviously the curators of the exhibition help you in finding these people, or you'll get a phone call from a friend like yourself to say, you know, check these people out, they may be able to help. So it's not that I use all the time one specific team, although I have Work quite a, a, a long time with Price and Myers, and I've worked a long time with CSI, Commercial Systems International. But at the same time, I've worked with W.S. Atkins for mechanical aspects on things. Um, I've worked with um, engineers in Japan um, uh, and, you know, elsewhere in the Far East and the Middle East. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you have to be flexible in that way. You have to be able to. Um, find people who can help you. And you're governed very much by, like I keep saying, cut the coat, suit the cloth. There is a budget, and you've got to be able to sort of be professional enough not to run over. If you start running over, it can be quite a complex a couple of debates and meetings <laughs> with committees to see how to claw back the money or the idea in, in, to, to realise it. So I always try to stay in budget. We always try and do as much homework as possible pre the build so we get it off to a T. Having said that, it's quite a frustrating thing initially or when I first started in that world because I wasn't used to having like the finished idea up front and then handing it over because there's always a moment where you think, did I get that right? So it became vital that I got involved with the factories and the engineers and I got to know it. I always made a rule, I'd know everyone by their first name and you get a good job if you do that. If you don't know that this their first name, <laughs> you're not going to get much from them. You know? But it's amazing. I mean, I've been to places and I've just watched people working as well, and I've learned. I remember when we did the first bearing for Over Easy, we had the 13... God, I've forgotten the measurements of them now. The, the, the RSJs, eight sections of RSJ uh, being bent up in... I've forgotten the company now, but they were based in Birmingham, and they roll heavy engineered steel and then the steel the, the, the eight sections we had for that were taken out into their yard and there was an old boy with a massive sledgehammer and he had a big chalk drawing very beautifully done on the on the floor and he was looking at it and he just touched it with a hammer and i said that's amazing what what are you doing he said i'm setting it he could set it to a millimeter and that was you know what 50 years of just knowing how much to hit it, 
listening to the sound it made, feeling it, you know, seeing it with his eyes, thinking about it, feeling it down his arm and knocking it. I just thought that was such a beautiful thing to watch. You know, it's, it's a priceless moment, actually, in the world of making, to see that man just know exactly what he's doing. So, yeah, it's, it's important to stay in contact at every stage of the job. And Tim and Jonathan will know that I'm a pest. I'm always there, you know, I've forgotten my hard hat, I haven't got my boots on, I'm just click, 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 talking, you know, what about that? You know, oi, get your PPE on, mate. <laughs> um, well, that was amazing. Thanks so much, Richard. I think, um, you know, I really, really relate to the conceptual crafting because you're doing things with materials that architects are not allowed to. Engineers are, you know, um, your trusty team to make sure that everything is feasible. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be damage to people and animals. Um, but uh, also for me, I see, in, uh, as Chris quite rightly pointed out, the playfulness. There's a dead, there's a humour running. There's a seam of a real humour running That's through it all. Many times, yeah. And I really like it. I like each one is like a bit like a friendly alien. As a curator, I'm also very mindful of the way in which your works of, you get positioned, also by the galleries or the mm. whoever owns it for the public. So the Saatchi um, Gallery, for example, they admonished audience and made sure, do not touch that oil because it's, you can't get it off you. But uh, apparently they, write, they wrote, I remember them writing, um, but if you like, you can blow on the surface just to <laughs> prove that it's oil, you know? I know, um, it's... it's, it's, it's uh, so it's like the curators uh, accepted the... The audiences wanted to relate in, an, in a psychological yeah. way and a visceral way yeah. with the presence of the object. So yeah. I think the, the presence of each of yeah. your installations. I mean, it's interesting because when I first made the oil, um, we didn't put any notices up. And I was insistent with Robin Klasnick about that, and he agreed with me because if you put notices up, it makes absolute sense why you would and you'd be a fool not to. Mm. But what you do is, if you, if you, put, if you made a piece of work and you went, danger, <laughs> automatically their head is in a zone <laughs> prepared for something. Yeah. And the idea was with that is that you go in there and you go, you know, what the... And I knew it would work because while I was constructing it, just after we'd filled the tank, we were opening the following week, I was in there doing some fine end tuning, you know, polishing, adjusting lights, that kind of thing. And uh, a man who, let's say, wasn't versed in the grammar of art came in. He was delivering a bulk of paper. And he said, what is this place? You know, I said, it's a gallery. It's an art gallery. He said, well, where's the art? I said, go through there. And he went in there. And he was trying to look. He said, how do I get downstairs? And I just put my finger in like that. And he nearly fell on the floor. He just couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, because he'd been fooled. And I think that's what I wanted from everybody. But you learn, you understand, you get people writing, trying to sue you. You, in the end, you have to give in. Mm -hmm. But it's a bit, you know, there's some, some situations where it works. There's, you, you, you hit strange things. I mean, I did it recently at the Haywood. And about a week in, I've forgotten the name of the show, but about a week in, I had a phone call from the chief curator. He said, look, we've got a problem. We're inundated with queues can we cut a hole in the wall and put a window in so that the queue can be less? I said, but you're going you're gonna to have a queue at the window. <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, you know, a way of remedying their predicament. Same with the Mike Nelson exhibition. Same with the Mike they Nelson would, exhibition. There were queues all around yeah, and yeah. to just go into the yeah. space at the beginning. Yeah. 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 Humour, um, humor, uh, let's say it's subconscious for me, it's not a deliberate method to use or technique to use, but I like the fact that it adds to the work. So it's not a deliberate thing, but yeah. I suppose it's it's just within my character. You know, yeah, my... Fr they're friendly aliens. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and with that, um, let's. Uh, Lovely. Thank you very much. Put everyone. our hands together.